Move to the beginning of the 20th century and the two big oil producers in the world of the United States and Russia. And I just don't think it's a coincidence that the United States and Russia, albeit Russia in the form of the Soviet Union, go on then to dominate the 20th century and that the European powers struggle as much as they do. Maybe it's energy independence that countries see as a prerequisite almost for geopolitical and economic leadership. But that technology in many ways can help you achieve that energy independence. It's no longer the resource-rich country, it'll be the ones that master the climate tech part. The country that has clearly got all the advantages at the moment is obviously China. The US is playing catch-up. The big structural force at play is, is that it's not possible for any um, Western power from serious influence in the Middle East. The energy transition as a chance for Europe to escape the geopolitical problems that have plagued Europe since the age of oil began. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Great Tech Game podcast where we bring you smart, insightful, big picture conversations about how technology is shaping geopolitics, how our world is evolving and how exactly things might actually pan out over the coming years and what that might mean for all of us. And so I'm very excited to have with me today Professor Helen Thompson who's a professor of political economy at the University of Cambridge and the author of a book recently called uh, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. And uh, so welcome, Professor Thompson. It's a pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to the conversation. As am I. As am I. Uh, professor Thompson, as uh, I was mentioning, there's much in your work that, that has challenged my own thinking. And, and so I'm excited to have this conversation with you, especially because you've painted such a broad picture, a broad historical context to explain the geopolitical disruptions that we are living through. So I'm excited to start off the conversation with that. You know, the, one of the interesting things that I found in your argument, uh, Professor Thompson, was, and I think you were trying to refer to it again, is how geopolitics or global geopolitics trends end up impacting domestic politics, right, and vice versa. And, uh, you know, of course, in a year where, you know, now many people are talking about this, a big chunk of the world is going into elections again this year, in 2024. I believe 40% of the world's population, maybe even bigger, big countries, big democracies, the US, the UK, India, many others are going into elections this year. At the same time, as we see probably geopolitics at the top of, every agenda, right? Uh, whether it's at the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos or whether it's in conversations inside governments, whether it's conversations in boardrooms, in corporate. So clearly geopolitics and geopolitical worries and disruptions are at the top of, are top of mind in a year when you have such a large number of elections happening. So I want to ask you, how do you anticipate this playing out, this inter intersection playing out how do you expect the current geopolitical disruptions impacting elections coming up this year and vice versa? How do you expect the outcomes of these elections to shape geopolitics by the end of 2024? I mean, I think the big one on the second side of it, so the impact of the election outcomes on geopolitics is clearly what happens in the United States. Absolutely. That is the, Correct. That is the one um, where there could be um, a significant change. I mean, I think that that argument can also be a little bit overblown um, because there's more continuity, I think, between Trump's foreign policy and Biden's foreign policy than is often um, recognised. And I think it actually goes beyond the, the China um, question. On the Do you think it'll extend question... to Europe as well? Uh, because that seems to be the main concern emanating from Europe, that if Trump comes back... I think that that's where it's difficult to say. I mean... There's no doubt that Trump will put much less importance on, if he were to be elected, much less importance on relations with the individual European states and the European Union. I think where the NATO question is, he will find himself constrained. I mean, in the same way in which he was constrained about what he could do um, 
with Russian sanctions last time round by legislation Congress kept passing to constrain him. He'd be constrained about NATO in the in the same um, way. And it's quite difficult to see a circumstance in which both houses of Congress are turned into sites of Trump, you know, Trump's dominance um, as an outcome, I think, of the election, whatever happens at the presidential level. On the question of the impact of the geopolitics on the elections, I think this is going to be, it is going to be quite a big deal. I mean, again, I think it's pretty obvious in the case of the United States um, in that is that Biden is not going to want to get into big new commitments, particularly in regard to the what's going on in the in the Middle East um, in the run up to this um, election. The last thing he wants, I would think, is to um, be able to allow Donald Trump or any other Republican candidate for that matter uh, on the Trump side of the party, I mean by that, to say, look, Biden's taken us into another war in the Middle East. And and that's quite hard, I think, given the situation um, in the Middle East at the moment, if you look at it from the American point of view, because they're involved in air operations against the, the Houthis. Uh, and in the last two weeks, or maybe even in the last week, um, we've had American soldiers, you know, very badly injured um, in Iraq. Uh, as a result of the uh, attacks by uh, Iranian-backed groups and militias um, in uh, Iraq, you've got attacks on uh, American um, bases in 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 Syria. So staying out of an, another war in the Middle East is not, is not going to be so easy um, during the course of this year. If you look at everything that's that, that's going on, and that's even leaving aside the question about whether the, the um, war between Israel and and Hamas um, sp- spreads into, say, a confrontation between Hezbollah and um, Israel and possibly even Iranian involvement, um, direct Iranian involvement in that. At the same time, I think we can already see that the politics of Ukraine in American politics, I mean by that, has become really hard and doesn't even need the election getting closer for that to be the case. The Congress has proved unwilling to um, extend military aid. Uh, I think that unless that um, Biden can find a way um, of moving in a way towards more of the center ground where voter opinion is on the US-Mexican border question, he's going to find it hard to get movement on the Ukraine question because... Yeah, um, and you've question. of course argued that I think that, that geopolitical turbulence helped Trump get elected back in 2016. Is your sense from what you were just saying that this geopolitical turbulence, especially in the Middle East, going to really help uh, Trump then effectively? Unless Biden can somehow pull off a miracle and prevent this escalation that seems to be happening? I actually think it's a bit harder for him this time to um, use the Middle East as effectively as I think that he did um, last time. Um, Because... The forever wars narrative, um, I think, is not quite as potent as it was back in in 2016. Because if you go back into 2016, um, like uh, Obama in the last couple of years of his presidency had gone back into Iraq quite directly with the operations against ISIS. Um, So that was an easy way for... Trump to say, look, you keep electing these people who say they're going to pull out with the Middle East and then they just go back in. And we've seen then in his own presidency that he wasn't actually in the end able to end the um, American intervention in Syria. He reduced it substantially, but he was essentially thwarted by people in his own administration with his attempts to withdraw completely from um, Syria. So he hasn't got, if you like, clean hands, you want to use that language in a way which he did in 2016 where foreign policy um is um concerned and and as well biden has made that big withdrawal from afghanistan so i just think that the charges against that he could deploy against biden on forever wars in the middle east and if we include afghanistan in that which i know it's not quite uh, that they're not quite they can't resonate in quite the same way 
as the attacks that he was making back yeah. in, in, in 2016. Yeah, um, there's another interesting uh, statement of yours that I want to unpack uh, that I read, which is that you've mentioned that this idea, and this is related to Trump again, I think, is I think you've argued that at least in the pre pandemic decade, this casting of um, this previous decade as a populist revolt, right, um, which has then facilitated a return to nationalism and other uh, other such movements has been misleading, right? Mm -hmm. Am I correct in understanding that you're saying that Trump's rise is not purely the result of populism as it's made out to be, for example? Many people argue that Trump has risen in many ways because of the populism that he's, he's been able to tap, which one can argue has been linked to the jobs lost to China and industries going out of the US, etc. Is your argument that that's an incorrect representation or maybe an incomplete representation of what has caused his rise in the past? I, I think that my issue with the populism narrative is really with the term populism rather than necessarily with all the bits that are put together or can differently be used to say, oh, well, that's populist or that's like populist. So my conceptual problem with the populist narrative, as it's often deployed anyway, is that it treats um, nationalism or nationhood, as I use the term, as something that's alien to democracy. So that when you see evidence of nationalism and the language of nationhood in democracy, that you're seeing something wrong with democracy, you're seeing the populist version of it. And I think that's just completely ahistorical because I think that you cannot separate out the origins of representative democracy from the, the rise of the nation. Uh, and that actually for a long time, it was kind of pretty much well understood that there was a very strong fusion between having representative democracy and having nation states. And so then if you then say this, it's populist when we see the language of the nation, then you have to go back and say a lot, a lot of things in representative democracy were inherently populist from the start. I mean, if you go back and say, read Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural address, it's saturated in the language of the nation. But most people who use the word populist don't want to describe Roosevelt as a as a, a populist. Now, if you then say, let's have a look at the party in American history, and this is where it's quite clarifying looking at the United States, the American that call themselves populist, the American populist like party back at the end of the 19th um, century, are there pretty clear parallels between the language of the populists and the approach of the populists and Donald Trump? Absolutely. I mean, I would say that Trump is a successor in a way to the American populist party with one crucial exception that I'll come to in a, in a, in a moment. And if you look at what the, the, original populists did is they combined class critiques of America with nativist appeals, um, particularly to whites, obviously. Um, and that's, I think, again, what Trump was doing. If you take the border question, there's a part of Donald Trump in 2016 that sounded like Bernie Sanders did talking about the border, which is essentially that there's class distributional um, consequences that capital, so to speak, to use um, or business in Trump's um, language wants um, cheap labor and is encouraging um, people to come. Um, and then effectively in Trump's telling of it, which obviously has got some basis to it, buying support for that in Washington with donations to politicians, including to politicians who get elected saying that they're going to get tough on the border. And then when they get to Washington, go off in the opposite direction. And Marco Rubio who was obviously a clear example of that in the way that Trump um, portrayed um, that. That's the point of overlap with Bernie Sanders. But then Trump went a whole lot further than that. And he made you know, some fairly uh, crudely you know, racist appeals um, to voters about keeping um, people of Mexican origin out of the United States. So it's it's with with Trump it was nativism plus class. With Sanders it was 
um, class. Now, doing the nativism and class together, that is, as I say, that's got a long history in the United States. It even precedes, I think, the American populists. But I think that if you have to see the um, the very fact of talking about the nation in a representative democracy is not the same thing as using a politician using crude nativism to try to win um, elections. Yeah, you've used a very interesting term, I think the revenge of history, right? And now you've taken us back in a way to uh, maybe a hundred plus years ago and found those parallels with Trump. So two questions that emanate in my head from that. One is, is this phenomenon similar to what you're finding like in other parts of Europe as well and maybe other parts of the world beyond Europe as well? Are there commonalities here? And if there are, are there then parallels to that same era that maybe you're referring to in the US context with other parts of the world as well? You know, obviously inequality people talk about, the pre-World War One era, for example, inequality levels are now similar. We are seeing similar levels of inequality in the world again today. Are there parallels there, uh, both with history and across countries? And that's why this populism seems to be gaining so much traction everywhere. Yeah, I think that there are. And the, the other conceptual um, move that I make in discussing democracy, so I don't use the language of of, of, um, of populism, is instead to talk about the problems that democ democracies face around aristocratic excess and democratic excess. So this goes back you know, to like, um, thinking that um, came out um, of analysing Roman history uh, and you say, look, the problem of um, or the people who thought like this, particularly a thinker called Polybius, you say that any government, any form of government in time essentially destroys itself, that it, it doesn't fulfil itself in time, it's in decline like over time. And the, the problem that destroys it, if it's not destroyed by external invasion, is that the form of government has too much of itself. So if it's a democracy, there's too much democracy too much insertion of the popular opinion into the centre of the democracy. If it's an aristocracy, there's too much aristocracy. The, 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 the few at the top end up not only with all the power and or, all the wealth, but they end up with ever more of it like, over time. And I think what's interesting about representative democracy is that you have both of those dynamics. You have a risk of democratic excess, um, which might, if we convert back to the populist language, might be the populism part of it. But I think yeah. the bigger risk, and if you look at it historically over time in representative democracies, has been the aristocratic excess. And that, that means the, the concentration of wealth and the concentration of power and a very strong relationship oh. between the, 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 the two. Now, I, I think that if you look across the world, and I, so I would put not only Europe and the United States, but into um, other um, parts of the world, I'd say particularly actually Latin America would is a very clear case here, I think, the Latin American democracies, um, is that you, you end up piling up more and more aristocratic excess. And the problem about it is, is that it's very difficult to undo it, except by complete crisis when it happens. So if you look then at European history, if you take the first part of the, the, the 20th century, you have like lots of it in the first few decades if you leave the first world war out of it for a moment and then the kind of reset on it all of going back to a more balanced way of, of representative democracy becomes the second world war and in particular i would say the way in which the international monetary system was set up after the second world war which while um in significant part because it allowed for states to control capital made it easier than it had hitherto been for governments to do certain kinds of things in economic policy that in a way could help sustain a narrative of shared economic nationhood. So spend money on welfare states at high, quite high level, commit to like full um, employment, not make it so easy for the very rich to avoid paying taxes by moving their money wherever they felt like 
um, in the in the world. And then what's happened is is that that Bretton Woods International Monetary Order that provided in a way uh, a geopolitical, if you like, even structure for taking at the some big edges, shall we say, of aristocratic excess. Once that got dismantled from the seventies, like onwards, then we get the return of aristocratic excess. Now, in a way, fueled particularly in the European Union case by the fact that you have technocrats being given authority in certain areas, like say the European, like central bank. So you don't just have an aristocracy in relation to wealth, but that you have an aristocracy in relation to techno technocracy um, as um, well. And I think it's proven, as we can see, pretty difficult um, for representative democracies to get out of the problems that uh, inequality and what I'm calling uh, aristocratic excess have, 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 have generated. And what you then get, and this is where the Trump is different than the American populists way back, is because the American populist party in the 1890s was made up by people who were the ones who were the losers um, of the <laughs> right. international economy and the American economy of that. Trump wasn't quite the contrary. He was part of the oligarchic class that he was critiquing in that sense. He was he was using the grievances generated by aristocratic excess for his own for his own purposes. Now, if you go back to like Roman history, you can see that really clearly. Um, I mean, that's the kind of that's the kind of politics that that generated. Like, too, is is that people like you know Caesar would be the class, uh, one of the examples of using the the grievances of the peoples he was appealing um, to to seize power for himself, uh, and then you have the people who are against him, like saying he breaks all the rules of the republic, he's killing the republic, he's a dictator, etc. Obviously, in Caesar's case, he did become a, um, a, a dictator, but you can you can see a pattern there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which is why I love the term that you you used. I think uh, the revenge of history, right? Unlike I think Bob Kaplan's revenge of geography, I think uh, I very much subscribe to this idea that you will often find great, very interesting patterns with history, right? And uh, whether or not history repeats itself, as I think one of my earlier podcast conversations we. Someone mentioned, I think it was a quote by Mark Twain, maybe, whether it was real or not, it's unclear, but um, the quote was, history rhymes, right? whether or not it repeats. Um, I, I, I also find it interesting, like, basis what you were just saying, that it's not the Democratic Party that's leading this, it's the Republican Party, which, as one of my earlier um, podcast guests from the US mentioned, you know, the Republican Party was supposed to be the country club party, right? Uh, it's the party of the elite, so it's um, <laughs> the Democrats are supposed to be the ones representing, as you were saying, the losers in the industrial capitalism era. But now, in a way, like, the, the tables have turned, and uh, Trump is leading from a Republican Party base this uh, representation of, of, of uh, populism or the losers, so to say. Um, I want to move into uh, uh, the second part of our conversation, which uh, talks about climate, energy, and geopolitics. We already touched upon it in um, a few ways, uh, but you've written, of course, about the complex history of energy and geopolitics. And I want to I want to tie this uh, in a little bit with my own book. Uh, as I've mentioned to you, my book, right, the Great Tech Game shaping geopolitics and the destiny of nations, one of the main arguments I make in that book, and I look into history a lot as well, going back 10,000, 15,000 years, I argue that there have been some great games in our past, or great eras in our past, where certain trends or certain shapers have shaped the geopolitics of the time, the economic destinies of people and regions at the time, and societies at the time. So, for example, agriculture completely shapes uh, which regions win and become more prosperous than others. Then you have trade, right? The era of global trade, where trading hubs and trading entrepots become very prosperous, sometimes even more so than the producers of, let's say, agricultural goods or other goods. And then, of course, I talk about the great colonization game, where you have the emergence of colonial powers, followed by industrialization, 
So these great gains in the past that have shaped the geopolitics of our time, and I come and, and capitalism, of course, in the last uh, couple of centuries. And I come to today's time and I argue that today, technology is that force that countries that are developing their tech capabilities, com countries that are developing great technology, great tech companies, right? This is the new engine of economic growth. So if Adam Smith argues, uh, you know, about his wealth of nations and his conceptualization of that, I argue that today tech is the new wealth of nations. Today tech is shaping geopolitics. Tech is shaping the U.S.-China war. Technological leadership is at the core of that U.S.-China geopolitical battle. And of course, tech is shaping economic inequality within societies. It's leading to the rise of the new tech titans, much like the Gilded Age in the U.S. Uh, you know, we're seeing this high levels of inequality that we were talking about. All said and done, I argue that it's tech that is driving all of these geopolitics. And you have, of course, authors like Chris Miller, who talk about the chip war and semiconductors being at the core of geopolitics. And then I reread your book and I hear a very different argument, right? Um, there's not much mention of technology and semiconductors and chips and, you know, 5G and AI and all of these things in your conceptualization of what's going on in geopolitics. It's energy, right? So I want to ask you, Tell me why. Why is it that for you, energy and geopolitics is at the core of so much and not, let's say, what many other people are now talking about, including myself, that technology is maybe at the core of today's geopolitics? This is a like a really, a really interesting question. And I actually thought about it um, quite a lot um, because I was aware that I was saying very little about technology. I mean, I think that um because of when i was writing it so which was largely in the first second half of 2019 and the first half of or oh, 2020 um 20. essentially is in terms of the us china tech war um it was just kind of beginning in the sense of overt moves being made by um, Trump. So although I've made some changes in relation to the paperback edition around the Biden administration, I, for various reasons, had to concentrate that on, on the Ukraine issue rather than on the chip war um, um, issue. So first of all, I would just say that you know, I entirely recognise that there is um, a technology, quite intense geopolitical conflict about technology going on between the US and um, China uh, in particular, and that that has got a history. It's not just like coming out of, of nowhere. So that there is a geopolitics of, of technology um, as well. I would say that I don't think it does as much to explain the disruptions geopolitically of the 21st century thus far than does the energy question, in part because it comes relatively late in the period. I know we're not that far into the 21st century, but in terms of the period in which we're like talking about. But stepping back from the micro, if you like, to the, the big picture, I would say, um, and I think I would sort of say this is my ground, so to speak, is that energy comes before technology, that energy is the life force of the universe, and that technology is subordinate to it in the sense that technology is ever more innovative applications of using energy for different purposes and in like different um in different ways so in that sense um technology depends upon energy now extracting energy also and using energy also depends on technology so it it, it does cut both ways um too um, but I think that the um, reason why I think that energy is prior in the geopolitical story than technology is because you can see, I think, once you start, if you like, once you put the energy glasses on, so to speak, and you go back to the history um, of the world since the time when oil 
starts to become a significant energy source and primarily it's for military reasons at the end of the 19th century um, even though it's being used domestically for light at that um, point once you construct it as an oil story a great deal of number of things become very clear i think that are not so if you leave oil out of the, the picture so you can see i think very clearly why there's a immense change in the balance of power in the world over the course of the 20th century when coal stops being the energy source or the primary energy source of military power and oil starts to to be so because the world of coal is a world geopolitically that was dominated by britain a, a country with abundant domestic supply a history of using it prior to the industrial revolution early movement um, into steam power in its navy that's what allows it to open up china in the first um, opium war move to the beginning of the 20th century and the two big oil producers in the world of the united states and russia and i just don't think it's a coincidence that the united states and russia albeit russia in the form of the soviet union go on then to dominate the 20th century and that the european powers struggle as much as they do I don't think it's at all a coincidence that the big internal European loser of that is Germany with catastrophic consequences by the time that we get to the the Nazis and the attempts at conquest and annihilation of population that Hitler goes in for in order to try to get Germany like an oil um, supply. I, I don't think it's a coincidence at all that the speed with which the Soviet Union comes apart in the latter part of the 80s begins with the oil price crash of like 1986 and all the problems that that causes. So I just think a lot of things become very clarifying in terms of the, the big historical trajectory of the 20th century when you do that. So then if you move on to where we are now, I would say, well, why would that stop? If you see what I mean? I mean, if you start yeah. looking in the 21st yeah. century, wouldn't we see if there are significant energy changes that this has consequences? And clearly there is something, there are two things that are really big. The first, and they're related to each other, is the first of all is, I'm just concentrating on oil now because gas is a separate question. First of all is that the stagnation of oil production in the world that takes place in 2005 and that the world is rescued from the consequences of that by the American shale oil boom. And then you can see when you start looking just how profoundly disruptive shale oil is because it completely upends the US-Saudi relationship as it's existed in the, the post-Second World War world. And then on top of that, there's not only shale oil, there's shale gas. That means that Russia has a competitor in the United States for European um, gas um, markets. And we can see what the consequences of, of, of these things are. Um, these things are and we can then see the economic consequences um, of needing effectively the monetary environment to support shale oil the shale oil boom yeah yeah and one can almost argue right based on what you're saying and what i have argued in my book that maybe it's energy independence that countries seek as a prerequisite almost for geopolitical and economic leadership or dominance but that technology in many ways can help you achieve that energy independence. And, and so when the U.S. comes up with that shale oil revolution, technology enables that, one. Uh, and today, if we were to jump to today, uh, you've written about this a fair bit. We are seeing this energy transition. We are possibly seeing a move away from an over-dependence on oil. Countries like China, the US, many other countries, even in Europe, one of the first reactions to the Ukraine conflict is, okay, how do we reduce our dependence on, on, on Russia? And, and so this new climate transition that we are going through is clearly partly an attempt to reduce dependence on those who control sources of energy that are in then turn sources of geopolitical power for those nations. So the question then that I have for you is, as we start to see this climate transition, what I think you've, you've mentioned it as the historical immensity of the 
energy revolution being uh, attempted and the geopolitics of net zero and so on and so forth. Which countries do you see as emerging as the new leaders in this? You know, climate technology and in the work I do as a tech venture capitalist now, climate tech has become a big uh, space where venture capitalists around the world are investing, large private equity firms are investing behind it. Literally, many major corporations are saying, okay, what kind of solar technology, what kind of electric vehicle mobility technology, what kind of battery technology, what kind of, I don't know, biofuels can we develop? Everything that can then change the energy mix that we'll have, let's say, two, three decades from now. So the question for you, as we see this energy transition being attempted, what is the impact on our geopolitical world order as you see it? Which countries win? Which countries do you expect to be relative losers? What is the impact you see happening and playing out over the next, let's say, decade or two? I think that the the country that has clearly got all the advantages at the moment is obviously China um, because of the fact that um, it dominates not so much metal production, um, but um, though it does that in uh, for rare earth elements, um, but it dominates the processing and the supply chains. And I'd say that um, if you look at it in terms of, of the new climate technologies, yeah, it dominates the resources that are necessary um, for the new climate technologies. Uh, and at the same time, is it's clearly um, um, moving pretty fast on electric um, vehicles, both in terms um, of use of electric vehicles in China, but also China as an becoming an exporting power um, on um, electric um, vehicles. US is playing catch up um, in this area, I think. And you can see, I think, the Inflation Reduction Act as being uh, a, a way of, uh, of trying to, to um, do accelerated um, catch up. I mean, I, I think there is an interesting issue here, though, and that is that I don't think that the geopolitics of metals is quite like the uh, um, the geopolitics uh, of oil and gas. Um, it's actually, if you look right now at the concentrations of metal production, then it's much more concentrated in particular countries than oil and gas is. Um, so if you if you take um, cobalt for instance, I think seventy percent of it is at the moment Congo. You, you, there's nothing that looks like that. I mean, I think by most calculations, like for oil, it would be about thirteen percent the highest, like um, for the um, for the US. This is different, I think, and and it, and, it, and also i think that there is if you like a um a geopolitics around the the processing let's call that the technology part of it that isn't quite the same again with i mean oil refineries really did matter in, in where that they were no, that, in that's certain... right I, you know I, I was recently at cop and uh, we had a panel on the geopolitics of climate of the climate transition and one of the points that i that i brought up there which i want to get your views on is that maybe in the oil and gas driven energy world that we were living in, it was easier for countries that were sitting on these reserves to also refine it and sell it and then have that power. Whereas if you look at today's emerging climate transition, you could be sitting on as much cobalt as you want. But unless you master the technology that's required to use that cobalt to, let's say, make XYZ things. So you might have lithium, but unless you know how to make the lithium batteries, Right. Um, you need to figure out how to make smartphones. You need to figure out how to make semiconductors. You need to figure out, uh, you know, how to make uh, cells. Right. So my argument was that it's no longer the resource rich country in the new climate world that will uh, be the powerful one or the winner. It'll be the ones that master the climate tech part, the technology part. Uh, because that's what's required to take it from that raw material or the metal piece that you're talking about 
to actually something really valuable, right? So it's the country that controls the battery technology that will win, not necessarily the element, the country that has the biggest reserves of that element. No, I agree. And this is where I think the history like matters when you go back, um, because clearly it isn't just the resource with oil and gas. You know, it's the capital, it's the technology, it's the refining um, capacity. It's actually then the transportation like um, of it. Um, and that what you saw in the oil story um, was outside the United States, I, you know, like mean by that is obviously foreign companies, the international oil companies providing capital, providing um, technology and doing so on pretty poor terms for the states that had the oil reserves concern. You know, in the case of like Britain, not least because of the imperial relationship be between Britain yeah. and the, the state in um, question, or at least a quasi-imperial relationship, like in the case um, of um, of um, Persia, where it's more sphere of influence, the sphere of influence rather than part um, like of the um, empire. And then you get to the, you get effectively, and I this simplifies, but you get to the nineteen seventies. Or the end of the 60s and 70s and then you have a an, an energy nationalism a resource nationalism against that and then you have the the state like owned um companies and sometimes that goes better than it does in in other um cases but if you like then say look at the venezuelan oil industry under chavez then you have all kinds of problems of not enough capital poor technology um, particularly given the specific nature of, of venezuelan um crude and you've got venezuela's Really having the largest oil reserves probably in the world and not really producing like um very um very much now clearly is the point of entry for the um the countries who haven't got or not just haven't got but perhaps more pertinently don't want to do domestic mining because i think that this is another part of the um story is let's dominate the processing and that is really what china has been doing because it's only really rare earth elements where china dominates the production all of its other domination is coming on the processing um side of it and the processing supply um chain sides um of it but i think you can already see that there's something akin to like the 70s moving away you take indonesia i'm fairly sure i'm right in saying that at a certain point they basically say if you there there, there was an ex an export ban on essentially unprocessed nickel i think it is in the case of indonesia so basically saying if you want to do the processing you're going to have to come here to do it so i still think there'll kind of be there will be still a geopolitics if you like around the technology of the processing in terms of like the states that have got it trying to say, okay, we do need you, but you've got to come on our terms. That's right. A, a very similar thing, by the way, uh, is going on on the, on the tech side that I talk about, which is around data, right? So people obviously are very loosely throw this term out, but they say data is the new oil. Um, but I mean, there are issues with that statement, but today countries that are sitting on data, a lot of data, they are saying to the larger tech companies, that if you want to use our data, you better set your servers here in our countries. You better have bigger teams here because we don't want you to extract the data out and do all the processing and all the value extraction basis that data in your countries. We want to see some of the economic benefit. And that's very similar to what you're describing. You know, the Venezuelans might have done or more recently the Indonesians are doing. Um, so lots of interesting parallels. Um, but where do you see the current oil uh, producing nations like the Saudi Arabia's of the world headed now? Would you worry about their economic future as we see this economic, uh, this climate transition pan out? I mean, I don't think that um, Saudi Arabia um, is anything like um, the problematic case for the move away from oil. I mean, if you just try and put some numbers on it and even let's say like on a very optimistic scenario, say the world is only using in 20 years time, 50 million barrels of oil a day, which is about half 
what it is like presently. And then you say, well, where are those 50 million barrels a day going to come from? Then I'd still think that a reasonable amount of it is going to come from Saudi Arabia. Um, now, there are questions about... Yes, the... but if you were to go back to your coal analogy, right? Um, yes, oil might still be part of the mix, but if the mix, if the part of the energy mix that's growing fastest at that time is dominated by some others, like, you know, you mentioned about the shift away from coal to oil and how that brings, you know, the US and uh, the Soviet Union as the two leading powers, then one can argue that uh, there will be a relative decline in the power, both economically and geopolitically, that today's oil-producing nations will see as maybe battery technologies or uh, other kind of climate technologies become the more faster-growing pieces of the energy mix. And so it might be relative. You might still be powerful, you might still be rich, but you might not be the ones that are, are really shaping the terms of the energy mix of the future. Well, I think that that and turns, the geopolitical. Yeah, I think though that that turns on really what in that scenario the fifty million barrels of oil a day is still doing, what purposes that they're being like used for, and how central they are both to military power and to the the future like that future like world economy. Um, because if they're still actually there, which is highly likely, I would have thought in this scenario to be the case, because they're incredibly difficult to replace present tense oil use with electrification, which is you know what we're 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 we're, we're talking about in terms of the energy transition and the very big um, picture. Um, then the need for them, where it's the need for that oil, where it's still need is is still going to be existential um and it's not like with coal that actually the issues in terms of um having it go away for instance you know if you're a country like um italy in the post cold war world sorry the post second world war world um with not really scarcely any like coal and coal is still central to the generation of electricity for the first at least for the first 20, 30 years after the, the Second World War, then whether you've got a domestic supply of coal or not is still a, a pretty important consideration in what kind of electricity sector um, that you can um, have. Again, it also um, depends, I think, on whether there's any real change in the demand for petrochemicals um, um, as, a, as a feedstock uh, in particular i mean if that remains as indispensable as it as it does then it's going to be oil plus um low carbon energy uh, and the technology around it I, I i think the direction of travel to be honest is is that we're going to have multiple tensions in geopolitics by having a multiple energy re source energy regime um that yeah, it's actually yeah, yeah. So almost like a multipolar order correct yeah. thing within the, the energy world that's right you add uh, you adding yeah if it's a multiple energy source world i think you get a multiple energy driven ge geopolitics yeah yeah no absolutely uh, i'm mindful of time so i want to move very quickly to the third piece uh of what i want to cover which is uh certain regions that i want to uh, get your views on right and what's happening there and what the implications of that might be for the broader geopolitics of the world the first one is the middle east right so We've spoken about it a little bit, of course. Um, but the most recent set of news coming out is, of course, around the Red Sea and what's happening in that part of the world. You've argued that maybe the U.S. is losing control of that area. There's economic implications, obviously, for Europe, countries like Italy, but, of course, countries like Egypt as well. You've made those parallels with the uh, Suez Canal, uh, part of our history for Europe, right? Now going back to 1967 with Nasser. Um, the Economist recently wrote about how along with the Red Sea and these routes, the Arctic and maybe the South China Sea, these will be like major naval battles. But let's talk about the Middle East first. Like, What's your sense of what's going on here? Is this a blip? Is this a temporary thing where we're seeing those routes being blocked off? Or is this something that you feel is here to stay? I think it's here to stay for 
the foreseeable future, at, le- at least unless and until something happens in relation to the Houthis' control of um, the, effectively the northern part of um, of uh, Yemen. I mean, if you, if you go back to 2019, you could see the, the Houthis making major attacks in the Persian Gulf, not least destroying... M- really significant arab sorry saudi arabian oil facilities on the on the west coast of the the persian um gulf so the houthis ability to cause serious disruption in the waters of the middle east the crucial ones the persian gulf and, and the red sea we're into the fourth year of that now i mean there's actually a bit before but in terms of like major um issues so this is not i think a situation that goes away if there is an end to the war between Israel and Hamas, and that's a, 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 a whole other um, question. Is it just Israel and Hamas though? So to your earlier point about structural forces and certain things just being the manifestation or the symptom, what's the bigger geopolitical structural force at play here? Is it just the israel Hamas battle or is there a bigger geopolitical force here at play that the Houthi, Houthi attacks are just a symptom of? I mean, I, I think, to be honest, the big structural force at play is is that it's not possible for any um, Western power to exercise um, serious influence in the in the Middle East. Uh, even if you go back to the point when it looks like that's the case, which is sort of the first Gulf War and the and the aftermath of that, um, it's still causing all kinds of problems. Actually, maintaining um the uh, the air patrol over the the Persian Gulf the no fly zones the French end up pulling out um, of of the operation um in the end the sanction regime against um Iraq it causes an intense amount of like humanitarian like suffering in the end the Americans say oh we're going to go and finish the job off we're going to take Saddam Hussein um out we know that that goes disastrously wrong there's all kinds of fallout uh, in terms of the long term consequences of the american failure in the in the the second um iraq um war and the americans have never really found a way of getting to grips with the iran issue um in the in the middle east since the revolution um back in uh, in 1979 yeah. i mean if you say like the absolutely underlying thing it seems to me is that european countries in particular but now china and japan as well are dependent upon the export of energy out of the Middle East and transit through the Persian Gulf for the energy plus the Red Sea for trade as well, including the China-Europe um, trade um, right. route. Yeah. And uh, none of these states have got the capacity to guarantee transit through these um, waters. And I don't think the Americans have either. I mean, if you look at the history of the Suez Canal, uh, in the since in the, in the post-war um, era, at no time have the Americans, at the point in which uh, transit through that has been threatened, have succeeded in keeping the Suez Canal open. I mean, they didn't. I mean, they, they vetoed Anglo-French-Israeli action to try to do that in 1956. Um, they did nothing to stop the canal being closed for eight years, from 1967 to 1975, and now. They're struggling um, to keep it possible to, to keep transit through the Red Sea up to the Suez Canal, and the consequence for Egypt of this, I think, is being underestimated. I mean, Egypt is already in a financial crisis without having a big crash in revenues from transit through the canal. Yeah, but how much of this, if I can link this back to the U.S.-China and the U.S.-Russia geopolitical battle, how much of this has to do with that as well? Is it that the instability that we're seeing now is partly a function of that broader geopolitical battle? Or is this purely about the Middle East, Iran, the US, etc.? Is the U is the is the Russia and the China angle not part of what's going on? It is. I mean I I, I think that it, it, I mean I think the way that I think about it is is that it's a continuous Middle East story, really, that goes back to the beginning of the age of oil and the weakness of um, Western powers there uh, in the long term, whether it be British imperial power, whether it be the 
American capacity to exercise sure. military power in the region. But the, what happened in the 2010s was that that long story interacted with the resurgence of Russian power, um, made possible in many ways by the um, difficulties of oil production in the 2000s, uh, leading to high prices and the China question. And that the crucial thing of the point of intersection then becomes the fact that at the beginning of the 2010s, Iran was still a relatively isolated power. It was causing a lot of problems in the Middle East, uh, not least through its groups at its support, whether you would call them proxies or I think they're a bit more independent than that, Hezbollah, um, um, Hamas, uh, and now obviously um, the Houthis. But it was relatively detached from Iran. Sorry, it was relatively detached from Russia and China in that respect. And indeed, Russia and China were on side with the Americans, really, in trying to get Iran nailed down on a nuclear um, deal. That what happened by the end of the decade was that Iran had m moved to a, a power that was quite strongly aligned with China and with Russia, and I'd say particularly with Russia. Part of the reason for that is Syria and the ways in which Iran and Russia ended up acting together to support um, Assad's regime. And that means yeah. that the, the Middle East picture in that sense has become part of the big geopolitical picture because if that's sort of driven by around US, China, Russia conflict, but it's still got its own yeah. history and the structural forces that are inherent to the Middle East working out, but it, it's now yeah. tied yeah. Via around moving from being a relatively independent player in the big geopolitical picture to being aligned China, Russia. Yeah, because my sense, the way I see it, right, it's if you go back two years ago, there was a lot of talk in um, the US before the Ukraine uh, crisis breaks out. There was a lot of talk in uh, Washington, D.C. that we need to contain China and uh, we need to have multiple fronts opened for China to stay contained in the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific region, right? Um but it seems to me that now the tables have turned. It's not the Chinese that have multiple fronts open. It's the Americans that have multiple fronts open. And uh, that to me has its own set of implications and possibly for how we expect this US-China geopolitical battle to play out. No, I mean, in that respect, I, I, I think that the, the Ukraine war is absolutely pivotal to that um, because um the americans were already i would say struggling with balancing middle east questions and china questions yeah and you can see that in the way in which obama after his pivot to asia speech in 2011 was in practice constantly being dragged back to middle east um questions um you can see that i think also with you know, Biden um, very much wants to the China focused um, policy. But, you know, by the, the, the summer of 2022, he's having to go off to Riyadh and um, practically beg Mohammed bin Salman to get OPEC plus to produce some more oil. And Mohammed bin Salman is not interested no. and indeed goes in the opposite direction um, just before the, the midterm elections. But by that point is that you've already got the the Russia front, if we call it that, open via Russia's invasion of Ukraine and America's very strong backing for Ukraine and that. And at that point, certainly the first months of the first sort of, I'd say between at least March of 2022 and maybe September-ish um, time, there still seemed quite a lot of optimism in Washington that a strategic blow could be delivered against Russia by pushing back in Ukraine, even to the point perhaps of reopening the Crimea um, question and pushing Russia out of Sevastopol. Now, that would have been obviously an immense strategic change, geopolitical change, I should say, in the world if we looked at it historically. But that isn't where we're going. Um, things have changed. So, so 
So in that sense, the problem for the American point of view is, is that they made a bid for something quite bid, big, really, around Russia and the Black Sea. And it doesn't look like it's going to um, succeed. And, and, then, and, and then the Middle East situation is like deteriorated and requiring not only more just bandwidth attention, but actually requiring use of American military power against the, the Houthis. Whilst the China question remains as it as it has been, and I think that has exposing or is exposing the um, Americans, including the the weakness I think in the way in which they thought about various of these geopolitical questions, which has tended to be I think to underestimate Russian power. Yeah, I, I want to talk about Europe briefly as well. You've talked about Europe's civilizational turn. You've uh, talked about Europe's bet on the new energy future. We're talking about the problems the U.S. is facing, but what's Europe uh, planning? What's Europe thinking about its future? What is this civilizational turn that you've spoken about? Um, and how, how do you see Europe's future now playing out? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the phrase of civilizational turn was actually mine. I think it was put as the, the title on one of the, 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 the podcasts on, 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 um, Podcast on these times. Right. Yeah. Um, so I mean, what, I, guests. What, yeah, what is true is, is that there's that you can see in um, various from various European politicians in quite a number of different countries, increasing civilizational language and actually the most interesting case of it is actually President Macron, who started to use that language quite strongly in like 2019 in terms of def talking about effectively sort of defending European civilization against US-China competition uh, and not getting swallowed up in that. He was also using it then to argue in favor of a reset of relations with Russia. And obviously that's proved to be like um, a dead end. But I think the big picture with Europe um, is just how difficult I think the, the new world is um, for um, European um, countries. Um, and a good deal of that, I think, is to do with the energy um, transition issues, because Europe, um, right back in the first decade of the, 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 the 21st century, led, I think, really on this by um, Germany, but doubled down on by the commitment to net zero in 2019 at the European level and talk about um, Europe being the first carbon, at least neutral net zero um, continent, essentially wanted to see the energy transition as a chance for Europe to escape the geopolitical problems that have plagued Europe since the age of oil began. Sort of, this is where we, we, we can have domestically, in a continent sense, generated energy again. We won't be stuck with the problems that we've had from having to import oil from wherever and gas from wherever else um, in, the, um, in the world. And the problem is, is that um, it, it doesn't quite look like that from the European point of view in terms of escaping uh, foreign resource dependency because of the metals question. Now, yeah. in a way, you can say that actually Europe's position, it's not geographically that good because the predominance of the metals required for the energy transition are in the Southern Hemisphere. On the other hand, there, is, there are some of these metals in Europe. The problem in Europe is, is the deep resistance amongst European electorates for this kind of mining to take place in European countries. There's a kind of mindset that says, we want it somewhere else. <laughs> put it on the other side, <laughs> put it on the other side of the world. We don't want all that <laughs> environmental. The dirty work um, should be happening on the continent, correct. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and that's just not gonna work in the, in the world, like, geopolitically. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, though, I mean, to, to play devil's advocate for a second, I think Europe seems to be saying that we wanna be a climate tech leader. Um, we want to be, uh, and of course, there's capital available. And even if you don't have the metals, to your point earlier about oil and other things, is the processing sometimes that can bring a lot of value add and economic wealth. 
So to the extent that Europe could leverage its capital, leverage its large corporates um, across the board, across various industries, to maybe part of, be part of the and lead the new climate tech revolution, maybe there's still hope. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the, the point at this uh, in this respect is that China is already there, uh, and so it actually requires um, dislodging China from its um, from from its um, present um, position. And there are certain areas, obviously, in which the United States wants to um, wants to um, compete um, too. So if you just look at Africa for African countries, for instance. European Union has been making a big deal for at least four or five years now. I mean, Merkel started it um, quite late in her premiership in terms of talking about how important Africa was for the for the for the European um, Union and wanting to make it a priority of the 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 period. I think it was in two thousand and twenty when the Germans held the EU um, presidency, um, but China was there, however many decades really, um, several decades before. The Europeans in in prioritising those kind of investment partnerships um, in uh, African um, countries, and in this respect, leaving the rare earth issue aside, then China's predicament's quite like the Europeans, in the sense is it's not going to do so well um, on the actual metal production. As I say, rare earth aside, it wants to be in the processing, technological processing um, space. It just that it it got to the game quicker than the European countries um, did. So for and Europe to compete, what, what, it now has to, it has to accelerate yeah. against China. What happens China. to Africa now? What happens to Africa now in your sense? And this is the last region I want to talk to talk to you about before we conclude. The new scramble for its resources: China, Europe, America. I mean, there's lots of uh, new partnerships being struck and new concessions being granted. I think you mentioned. Uh, the fact that France had to yield and ends its uh, military presence in Niger um, for cobalt and for other, there's a new scramble again right for Africa's resources. But I want to talk about it from the African standpoint for a second. Africa has in many ways missed out on many of the great games that I've spoken about. Right, it's been on the receiving end of the great colonization, great industrialization game, great capitalism game. One can argue even what I call the great tech game. Is your sense that that's going to likely continue where it just remains a source of these resources, metals and otherwise? Or is there a chance or are there signs you're seeing that African nations or at least a few African nations could leverage their uh, strengths uh, in a world that's fractured geopolitically now to somehow... Uh, move up the value chain and not remain just a, you know, continent which is uh, seeing just its resources being extracted primarily. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that is a a genuine like possibility. Not least because I, I think that we can already see um, that um, African countries um, are not just going to bend over um, to either the state interests or the corporate interests um, of outside powers, whether that be Chinese, Europeans, like Americans, um, and that there's a, a, a very strong awareness, I think, in many African countries now of what's actually at stake in relation to this new geopolitical geo competition in which that they're being like fought over. And if you go back to that, to those series of, of coups in West Africa, so in the Francophone um, Africa that happened, um, well, happened over the last few years, and the uh, one in Niger obviously being like particularly um, significant, you can see that there, I think, uh, there wasn't a, um, a really explicit like agenda around we're booting the French out where uranium's concerned. Um, given that twenty five percent of the uranium in France was coming from amnesia, having said that, you look what Macron's you look what Macron's been doing since that coup. He's been to parts of the world, not least Kazakhstan, looking for deals on uranium because he understands oh, that. Actually, okay. 
you that you can't just like take that for granted like any longer now it doesn't those yours which i'm saying you'll say it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game like that it the energy nationalism or the resource nationalism doesn't just have to be okay we'll have state control and we'll try and do it we'll just try and do it all ourselves and use it as a geopolitical weapon it can be more creative than that and in the sense of like of, as you say of, of of like leveraging what the resources that they do have for uh a, a, a stake in the higher um, value added part um, of the chain yeah, uh, the bigger around game. yeah and yeah, that then yeah, becomes yeah. that's the possibility for it to be economically transformative for some african countries yeah, yeah. No, that's right. That's right. And I, I, as I argue in my book, at least, have a way to win at the Great Tech game and not, again, like history, we were talking about the revenge of history, like losing out on, um, you know, really participating and winning at uh, these economic and geopolitical games that, that we're currently seeing. Um, no, this has been uh, absolutely fascinating. We've covered lots of themes and lots of parts of the world and uh, I've taken up more time of yours than I had asked for. So thank you for your uh, generosity oh, with your time to talk and to you. your insights. Um, I have one last thing. Uh, we end every podcast with two quick questions, uh, which are not so geopolitical or so macro in nature, but uh, I would say simpler, I hope, uh, which is um, given the kinds of themes we've spoken about, uh, Professor Thompson, uh, I'd love for you to recommend a book other than, of course, your own or mine, uh, that you you would think that our listeners would benefit uh, from reading, one. And second, uh, another podcast guest that you think uh, we'd find interesting to bring on to the podcast. Okay. One person who's really um, interesting you might think about um, is, because it's a counter to technology, so I'll give you a chance to talk about sort of technology again, like versus... Uh, not necessarily just energy, but material resource questions is uh, is a, a journalist in the UK called Ed Conway. He wrote a book called The Material World. Um, it's really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, a book, I always struggle with these kind of questions because I read so many books and this question of like which 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 which, which point to to. I have um, to say this is a pattern, Professor Thompson. Uh, this is a pattern. Uh, with my podcast guests, we can discuss the most difficult, most complex geopolitical yeah. <laughs> questions. <laughs> I think no one is stumped on those. But the moment I ask what I think were simpler questions, like, um... <laughs> um, this is going to be a book that's not directly about what we've been um, talking about. And it's a book about, it's, it's a really important book about geopolitical history, which tries to take the whole world in. It's called um, After Tamerlane, uh, and it sort of it, it basically gives you a sense of being able to think about geopolitical change in Eurasia. Uh, John Darwin, I'm pretty sure that's the name of the author, uh, to think about geopolitical change in Eurasia over centuries. So even though a lot of it's you know way before what we're talking about, there's just something in yeah. its historical lens that I think is quite clarifying as context for putting in the present geopolitics because it kind of challenges some of the assumptions that we make about what the historical norms um, are. And in particular, in seeing in a way the the contingency, the historical contingency of the arrangements of the 20th century. So John yeah, Darwin, yeah, yeah. after Tamerlane. And, uh, and Ed Conway. No, great. Thanks so much for those recommendations as well. This has been an absolute pleasure and... Uh... I, I hope to stay in touch and continue talking about uh, some of these issues with you. Yeah, I would love to stay in touch. Thanks very much. <laughs>